I just trekked through up to my knees in water. This is unbelievable. We were, two hours ago, we were underwater. A flood of trouble. Neighborhoods swamped by torrential rains despite the multi-million dollar pumping system in place to spare them. Miami's the number one uh, at-risk city in the entire world from sea level rise. Environmental crusader Al Gore opens his new movie in Miami just in time for the deluge. He blames global warming. Venezuela deserves democracy, and the Venezuelan people deserve freedom. The U.S. weighs its options as a defiant Venezuelan government cements its power. We are taking you live to Caracas. Good morning. We begin this program with the wake up call. South Florida faced this week swamped at a standstill and in a flood of trouble. And Miami Beach fared among the worst places despite a multi million dollar pumping system, raised streets, and a new stormwater drain system. On submerged streets, cars stalled out, water cascaded into buildings and businesses, and the pumps the city installed to prevent flooding stopped working. No power, no pumps and no backup generators, why not? Miami Beach Mayor Philip Levine has made resiliency his signature issue, and he faced questions this week about what went wrong. Rising waters are Broward's issues too. Dr. Samantha Danchik is the county's assistant director of the environmental planning and community resistance there. And we are so happy to have you both with us this morning. Thanks Good so morning. much for being here. Great to have you here. All right, that is the question, Mr. Mayor. What happened on Tuesday? You spent half a million dollars to prevent this kind of a catastrophic afternoon. What, what went wrong? Well, Michael, let me tell you. First of all, you know, it's funny when people say you spend 500 million and I'll say, well, we have not spent 500 million. We've actually only spent 80 million. We've only been able to do 15% of our entire city. But it's a good question. Former Vice President Al Gore was here, and he calls it a rain bomb. And that's what actually happened on Tuesday. So the National Weather Service came to us, and they said, uh, obviously with their advisory, two to three inches of rain. Our pumps in those areas are able to handle three inches per hour. What did we get? We got nine inches. These catastrophic, unusual events are becoming usual. Now, right. but why weren't there backup generators so let me, for those pumps? Let me tell you specifically. What we have been using is portable generators in certain areas as needed. They didn't have the portable generators out because they were expecting two inches. We didn't expect nine inches. That was our mistake. We know now that we have to expect the unexpected. We, are, we plan to put in permanent generators. In February, our commission said, let's do it. Our city went through a procurement process. They want to save money for the residents and it's taken a long time to put them in. You know, I'm the, the mayor that's very impatient, very frustrated. I'm always like, it's an emergency, let's get it done. Yeah. So un unfortunately, you know, they needed to go through that process. Now we've declared an emergency. We're putting in permanent generators where need be. But the other thing to understand is that a generator is not so small. A generator is massive. It can be the size of right. two or three cars outside the road. Mayor, before we bring Samantha Danchik sure. in and, and Broward into this mix, just one more thing about the generators. This week, we heard Eric Carpenter, who is the assistant city manager in charge of that whole project. Public Works, yes. Why, why wasn't electricity, in this case, also last fall, the pump, somebody forgot mm -hmm. to turn the pumps on, and last fall there was an event very similar. Why wouldn't electricity and generators be an essential Perfect. component from the get-go in this project? So what we chose to do, Glenna, is we chose to use portable generators. We only have so much funds available. And once again, just to kind of go back to what we're designed for, our pumping system is designed for for sea level rise. It's designed for normal rains. But when we have a catastrophic, severe situation like that, then the power goes out. I we now was, know that's going to happen I, more. I, I, excuse me, I thought sure. it was designed for king tides. For king tides, sea level rise, exactly. And we're able to handle that. But with a severe, unexpected, massive flood like that, and this is the interesting thing, if we have hurricane level rains, there's no pumping system that's going to be able to dry your streets instantly. Now, the good news is, is that even though we had 45 minutes of power outage, those streets became dry where we had the pumps very quickly thereafter. Two years ago, they'd still be wet today, and they're not. Yeah. We have a long way to go. There is no textbook written on this. We're learning as we go, and we're going to get better as we go. Samantha, you are one of the authors of the textbook that Broward County is using, are you not? Did, so I Tell about this week in Broward. Yeah. Um, so Broward has had similar flooding. Um, recently, a couple weeks back, we actually had a similar uh, incident out at, at Sawgrass Mills where they needed to make sure that... Right there was um, you know, capacity within the stormwater system to handle that level of flooding. I think it's really important to, to listen to what the mayor said as far as these storms are going to become more intense. 
The systems that we have are designed for a certain capacity, and so expecting them to do more than what they're designed for is, as an engineer is, is, doesn't make sense. And I think the public needs to have an appreciation for the fact that you know, flooding will still happen. We cannot make all these systems 100% perfect, and we need that water to come and hit the ground as well. well what you're doing is adding resiliency projects like the pumping system to an infrastructure that in some cases in the counties are older than we are, 50, sure. 60 years old. How do you then put this new fangled engineering on and expect old infrastructure to be compatible? So Broward has started to look at groundwater rise that's as expected as a result of the sea level rise. And we found that some of the coastal areas for every foot of sea level rise, you're gonna get a foot of groundwater rise. And um, as you move further west, it's, it's not as, as strong of a response, but that completely changes the way that we ch design our drainage systems. And so we've tried to put that information out as a tool so the engineers, so that everything that is getting developed um, today and that will be built in place today will be built based on those future conditions. And so I think as you use redevelopment as a tool in order to integrate these smarter investments, that's how we're going to be able to you know, increase yeah. our capacity over time yeah, and update uh, the systems. Mayor Levine, <coughs> in um, <coughs> May of last year, a former engineer named Dwight Crawl, who was appointed mm -hmm. to a city commission to look into flooding and mitigation, uh, he wrote to the city commission and you saying, quote, it's inevitable that sooner or later there will be a major power outage during a time of heavy rain and high tides. Without backup generators, there will be catastrophic flooding. It was a red flag Absolutely. that was raised. Was it ignored? Absolutely not. In February of this year, our commission said we want permanent generators. We approved it to move it forward. The unfortunate thing sometimes, but the Michael, city manager, but the, didn't the, the city manager, Jimmy Morales, say they are large, they are noisy, maybe we want temporary generators? Well, we've been using in? temporary generators all along, but the city commission approved in February we want permanent generators. So that is moving forward. The fact of the matter is, unfortunately, different than the private sector, the government moves a little slower with their procurement. If it was up right. to me, we would have bought them in February right then and there, and I would have bought them. But we have procurement procedures, and now we're going around them because this is an emergency. So we listened. We're doing it. But the fact is, it hadn't happened as fast as we would like it to have happened. And this unexpected, severe weather storm, it's going to happen more and more. But I think the, the good news is we're learning, we're listening, we're going to continue to improve. But the one thing I want to always make sure people understand is that Miami Beach is a, is a good-sized city. We've only worked on 15%. <clears throat> There's a larger city out there we haven't begun, and we need federal help, and we need the state of Florida to help us fund this. And what you can't talk about, obviously, is the city of Miami had its own issues. Absolutely. In Brickell and in Flagler, the drainage project on Flagler didn't work on Tuesday. Broward County, you work countywide, but in Broward, there are how, 29, 30, 31 cities, independent governments? 31, yep. how, 31 now. How, how does the county and the city um, work together, and how, how do the two municipalities get along? I mean, are there, have you found that there are fights about funding, about neighborhoods, about, as the mayor talked about, people who are in residential areas that don't want big things in their neighborhoods? Sure. So through the Southeast Regional uh, Climate Compact, we have been working at the four county level, but then also with the cities individually, and we often try and highlight an individual city's issues and work through them to try and develop what the resiliency project should be. And so we've done that, for example, for focusing on Dania Beach and Hollywood and, and, and Hallandale Beach as well this year. Um, so that's the way we kind of bring our regional resources to their assistance. In addition, we're trying to provide that kind of background and baseline modeling and technical information that may be too expensive for each individually to undertake. And so we're providing it at the regional level. Um, and as I said, so we're a resource for the city as they're kind of working through these different issues. You know, we're, we're trying to think bigger picture of how we yeah. can uh, Dr. Danchuk, l let me ask you about an incident a couple of years ago when Superstorm Sandy came through. We only got the wave action. We didn't get the storm, but it wiped out a good portion of A1A on Fort Lauderdale it Beach. Did. Now, explain to us when that was rebuilt. It was rebuilt in a way to <clears throat> mitigate future flooding? And we highlight that project uh, uh, frequently because, you know, in addition to the intense erosion that occurred along that section of beach, it broke apart the roadway and then dumped a bunch of sand on top of that uh, A1A right. stretch, which was an evacuation route for the people that live on the barrier island. So total shutdown of, of access to that, to that area. 
So what we realized is we needed to prevent sand from being over, be able to overtop the road. So they put in like a, a short knee wall in order to block some of the sand. They um, drove sheep piles about 42 feet into uh, the, the beach berm so that it won't get undermined again, so the road won't break apart. And then the last piece is that they angled the road so that actually it provides even a couple more inches of surge protection by having the road angled up towards. So those are the types of really innovative ways that um, you know the state and, and, and local municipalities were able to integrate you know, new resiliency features into the design and maybe even go around what typically was expected by the state because typically we're not supposed to put structures on the beach mm. because you're concerned that that might exacerbate erosion. Right. In this case, it was found that it was it, it will actually prevent, um, um, you good. know, damage to the infrastructure. Yeah, good news. All right, so before we run out of time, Mr. Mayor, when will these generators be purchased? When will they be in place? We are working on it this week, I can promise you. But the portable generators are being actually mobilized and available all over the city, like we did last year. But just to your point, Doctor, you know, for example, Indian Creek Drive, as you know, Michael, that's an area that was overrun by water continuously, yeah. and it's also an evacuation point. Right. We've went up to Tallahassee, we got the state involved, we're putting money in, we're raising that road, our seawall's right. being rebuilt, and we're doing the same thing. And what I want to tell people is this, Nothing, nothing is 100% effective, but doing nothing is 100% ineffective, you and know, we will not do nothing. To your point, we were talking before the program about how people have to do their part, businesses have to do their Absolutely. part as well. Uh, a really interesting unintended consequence to the street raising that's done in the Sunset Harbor of Miami Beach is one of the businesses there has found that now that the street has been raised, they are at below street level, and FEMA, who, when he put in a, an insurance claim for a flood last fall, decided that they're now at basement level, unintended consequence, and that that claim is not going to be paid. Mm -hmm. What should people know as this mitigation and resiliency is taking place over the long term about flood insurance and issues that they are, that are going to cost them a sure. lot of money? Well, these commercial structures, Glenn, it's a very good question. We're working with FEMA to make sure that somehow that they exclude that. But I think the issue is this. In Miami Beach, we're dealing with a couple of things. We have historic buildings that are very low that we'd like to protect. And that is a very, very challenging issue for us to deal with. But we know we want to protect them, but we also know that we got to raise our streets and make them dry. Because if their streets aren't passable, you can't even get to these buildings. Mayor Philip Levine, great to have you come in. Dr. Samantha Danchuk, great Thank to have you. Much. Keep up the good work in Broward. All right, uh, coming up later this hour, I'm going to have a sit-down interview with former Vice President Al Gore, and he ties this week's flooding here to sea level rise and global warming. First, though, we're going to take you live to Caracas, where reporter Cody Weddle is covering a newly empowered Maduro government and the U.S. response. And now to Venezuela, where that country's new Constitutional Assembly convened on Friday for the first time. That body has virtually unlimited power to wipe out current government institutions like the National Assembly and fire opposition office holders like the Attorney General. And earlier this week, two of Venezuela's most visible and vocal opposition leaders were taken from their homes and held in military prisons. Many in South Florida's Venezuelan community and those supporting democracy convened in opposition this weekend at Miami's Torch of Friendship. Some are calling for even stronger sanctions than the Trump administration has already imposed on Nicolas Maduro's government. And they're looking for ways to help Venezuelans suffering in a collapsing economy. We want to get right now to our colleague stationed in Caracas. Reporter Cody Weddle has the latest developments. Cody, we are hearing that there is a bit of breaking news, some sort of an attack at a military post there. What can you tell us? That's right, Glenna. Just this morning, uh, Diosdado Cabello, who is the vice president of the Socialist Party, he tweeted that a military uprising in Valencia, which is a city just outside of Caracas, had been crushed. Um, now, a video has emerged on social media of these military members. They say they are in uh, rebellion, and we understand that they attempted to steal some arms there at the military base, and it still remains unclear uh, whether this is an isolated incident, uh, whether or whether perhaps they are further organized, also unclear if this is still ongoing at this point or if, in fact, as Cabello said, it has been crushed. But we'll continue to keep an eye on that. 
this morning that late last night that Leopoldo Lopez, one of the leading opposition leaders, was returned from military prison to house arrest. That means that he and Antonio Ledesma, another former mayor, are both now out of that prison. Uh, why were they put in prison in the first place? I wish I knew, and, I, and so many people here wish they knew as well. Such a bizarre uh, turn of events here. They were taken into custody. They were previously under house arrest, both of them uh, taken into custody, supposedly for um, publishing uh, videos with political statements. But just a few weeks later, Antonio Ledesma, a few days ago, returned to house arrest. And just this morning, Leopoldo Lopez once again returned to house arrest. So many people here scratching their heads. What is the government tactic here? Why did this all happen? Uh, nobody really has any answers. We do know at this point that the house of Leopoldo Lopez is uh, shut off by intelligence police. They're not allowing press or anyone uh, near his house uh, right now. He uh, presumably right now is inside his, his home. Cody Lopez and Ledesma, two faces of a very uh, vocal and apparent opposition. We have been watching protests of opposition in the streets for months, violent and deadly as that country spirals. Now, though, this weekend with Nicolas Maduro's new National Assembly, new strong powers, do you get the sense there that despite all the opposition, this government has reached the point of no return? Is there that sense? Very much so, Glenna. Um, I think people didn't feel like uh, President Maduro would be able to implement this new body. And this body is really extraordinary because it's the most uh, powerful group in the country uh, right now. In other words, they have powers over all other branches of government. And they're not only going to be writing a constitution, they can make decisions as they go. And we saw that uh, just yesterday. They have fired the attorney general here, Luisa Ortega, who had been dissenting from the government, they have replaced her. Uh, so just extraordinary now that um, this group of 545 people is in control here. There is uh, no other group that has a check or balance on this new assembly. Cody Weto, we are so glad you were there reporting for Local 10 News. Keep up the good work. All right, thanks for having me. And up next, we take that and all the big stories of the week right to the round table. Stay with us. It is that time again, time for a closer, more analytical look at the week's top news stories and also some informed opinion. We are joined now by our powerhouse roundtable today. Some introductions first. Mark Caputo is the Florida correspondent for Politico and author of the Daily Politico Florida Playbook. Marlon Hill is an attorney with the Hamilton Miller and Berthesel firm and past president of the Caribbean Bar Association. Melba Pearson is deputy director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Florida and a former prosecutor with the Miami-Dade State Attorney. Welcome aboard, everybody. Great to Thank have you, you all morning. here. Marlon Hill, um, the situation in Venezuela is dire. What can the U.S. do that is meaningful to try and create a transition? I mean, don't we need to get a coalition of Central American Caribbean countries and put more pressure on Maduro because we, the U.S. can't do it alone. Certain, certainly, they. Um, I think the <coughs> ambassador of the United Nations and also um, our secretary to the OAS, they need to do a lot more work within the region because Venezuela is squarely tied to many of the nations when the OAS, you know, through the whole Petrocarib deal that and they have. And they give cheap oil to yeah. some Caribbean nations which vote with them or for them as a result. Absolutely, but Maduro, he can't really sustain what Chavez had before, even though the military is on the side of the Chavistas, right? So that's, he's all depending on that. And you see signs of that weakening um, within his government. I'm not sure how long he can sustain it. Well, it, interesting that you bring that up because what Cody Weddle just reported was that there might be some sort of military rebellion. We have no idea what that means at this point. This is just going down. But the strength, the military strength, if that's with the Maduro government, there is nobody, really, Melba, that can do anything about it. And if this is, if this is a crack in the armor, and if these people we're seeing right now are staging what looks to be a rebellion, 
all bets are off. All bets are off. And my mind sort of turns to the whole immigration consequences with regards to that, because I'm even experiencing in my own life where I'm encountering more folks from Venezuela that have fled you know, this tyranny and are here basically with nothing. And those who have the ability to leave. Right. And that's part right. of the problem right, in regards to income inequality in Venezuela. Right. And that's going to be the, the battle between the opposition. Yeah. Mark Caputo yeah. wrote all about the political ramifications of Ven Venezuelan immigration to South Florida. Yeah, well, right now, there aren't a lot of Venezuelan voters. There's about, according to the University of Florida's Dan Smith, political science professor, uh, he determined there are about 36,000, 35,000 foreign or Venezuelan-born voters on Florida's voter rolls. They voted very high rates. Uh, primarily, they are non-party affiliation voters. They're independent, like half of them. So they're an up-for-grabs segment of the electorate. But uh, in the end, we can't really say that the Venezuela issue is going to dominate Florida politics. But, you know, we have a history of razor-thin election margins. Yeah. So every little vote counts. And also, as Marco Rubio said a few years ago, Venezuela is basically the new Cuba. And you're seeing a lot of uh, affinity and association between the Cuban exiles and the Venezuelan exile community. Right. So I think that'll be significant. But to answer your question of Marlon earlier, what can we do to change Venezuela's behavior? I don't think really anything. Because look at Cuba. We've had an embargo on them for right. you know, five decades. Haven't really changed for us. Uh, it might be that we want to do sanctions and yeah. punishments because we think that the moral thing to do and the right thing right. to do, not because yeah. they're going to change well, their behavior. Well, I, I would point out that I don't think that Nicolas Maduro, a former truck driver, nothing wrong with truck drivers, uh, is not nearly in the class of shrewdness and... and He's not a Jesuit <laughs> educated he, person he, like Fidel exactly, Castro. Not yeah. Fidel or Raul are very clever, wily people. I don't think Maduro is in that class. He's a bum no. and a thug. What you Thank see, you. though, in and Venezuela, what you didn't see in the Cuban rebellion are those street protests, and you would never see a military uprising. You didn't see people on social media, because frankly there was no social media, right. tweeting out violence in the street and showing the world what's going on. I mean, that, that is a game changer. Yeah, he won't be able to contain the opposition for very, very, very long. And if the military starts to see that the country is, and oil prices are also dropping, so his, what he's depending on in terms of his resources are, are also running out. That's right. Well. When Chavez was in charge, oil was $100 a barrel. Now it's, what, $47, and uh, the economy in Venezuela, Pedavesa, is just in, in real trouble. I, I think there's another thing we should think about is the cocaine trade. There's going to be a pressure to bring money into the government, and Venezuela is ideally situated for shipping cocaine. And so the government there, at least unofficially, I would expect might be considering that. Wow. <coughs> Whoa. Silence. Yeah. Problem. I mean, <laughs> cocaine, that's a huge mic drums. Cocaine, yeah. Is, yeah, cocaine is a license to print money. Right. Uh, and, and, and it's a dual benefit for them because not only can they make money off of it, but they know the United States has uh, some of the biggest noses for cocaine. So it's a way, in their phrase, to probably you know, help yeah. poison the Yankee imperialist dogs. Mm. And to wow. sort of put a point on this conversation, uh, it's, in my view, very disappointing that Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has essentially done nothing, said nothing at all about Venezuela, I mean, certainly North Korea, Iran are occupying his time, but the State Department... Uh, but certainly he needs a staff, he needs a staff to do it, Michael. Yeah, you know, one of the things that they could probably do is appoint, appoint a regional ambassador to, to deal with the issues. This yeah. is really a great time to deal with Central American and Caribbean relationships. Yeah. I'm sorry, I know we need to move on, but Rex Tillerson used to head Exxon. He's an oil man. Yeah. And he doesn't want to crack down on his old oil buddies in Venezuela. Go figure. <laughs> it all yeah. comes together. <laughs> all right, so all Melba, let, let me get your reaction. On Tuesday, we all got wet in South Florida, especially if you lived in the Mary Brickle Village area of the city of Miami or almost anywhere on the southern part of Miami Beach. Did you get wet? Did you? What did you think when you saw this video? Paddleboarding? <laughs> you, you were in it, weren't you? <laughs> well, the problem is I'm speaking as a two-decade Miami Beach resident. Okay. So I have weathered many of these floods, and they don't seem to be getting better. So this is exhibit A for climate change. <laughs> Let's, that's, but that's what, a separate issue. But be that as it may, a little disappointed that the pumps aren't, that we sat through all this construction and all this drama trying to you know, navigate the yeah. streets of Miami Beach, and the pumps are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, which right. is and so when the mayor says, the water, well, we've only spent $80 million on mitigation and new pumps, you might say, well, gee, shouldn't that be enough to at least make a dent? One would think so, but the events of this past week have shown we're not prepared for that, and heaven forbid should we end up in a hurricane situation. It's going to happen again. Yeah, it's going to happen again. Going to happen again. <laughs> high, high seas, King raising tide, tide mm -hmm. right, and not enough 
infrastructure to, you to, know, what's to interesting to me is that to your point, there is nothing that's going to hold back rising seas and flooding and whatever you think causes it aside, it's happening. But politicians are coming out to say, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to save you. And people are buying into the fact that, oh, let's try, let's spend the money and try. Mark, th this is such a political issue that isn't going to be fixed. Right. Well, I I've talked to a few scientists. They say there's 20 years of global warming carbon built into the system. So if we went to zero carbon emissions worldwide, the seas would continue to rise and the globe would continue to heat because of our activity, according to them. So we still need to do something about it. And I think, and you're starting to see it in places like Tampa, where there's actually discussions and they're, they're kind of commissioned of like, let's not talk about carbon and all that stuff, but let's talk about mitigation. And yeah. we're not doing enough of it. And mm. I think, yes, you say, is $80 million enough? No, the seas are rising. But that's you can't fight the what, sea what, with $80 million. That, that's actually the question. What is enough? You can spend, I mean, Miami Beach is spending, all told, a half a billion dollars doing really interesting, great, proactive things. And I think it did help, to the mayor's point, dry out earlier. It didn't help right. the flooding, but it helped right. the drying out. But eventually, that's not going to matter. They're going to have, like Miami Beach is Exhibit A. If you, if yeah. you look at like South Beach, you'll notice like all, and throughout the beach, the new buildings along the actual coast are built really high up. And it's in the center that things are on slab and on the ground. Those things, because of market forces and the forces of rising tides, are eventually going to get knocked out by the insurance costs mm -hmm. and also just by the sea. And, and they're they going to have to build up. And, and the insurance is the big happen. thing, too, because Huge. it's going to be almost Huge. impossible to insure your property on Miami Beach. And then what? The Mother market forces uh, will take it. And then Mother yeah. Nature says, listen, it's enough. Everyone can move to Liberty City where everything is high. So Melbourne, you know, <laughs> you can, move, you can move west. I'll, I'll be a pioneer. <laughs> well, when the new Liberty Square is available. We'll take a look. <laughs> After the indictments are done. Like, oh. Oh, in, in, oh. Sorry. Wait, <laughs> quick break. <laughs> right there when we come back. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back live in our studio this morning. A very rowdy kind of uh, <laughs> round table in, a, in the best kind of way. That's a good thing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on here. We need to talk about Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz and a former IT guy. Worked for her for a long time, since 2005. His name is Imran Iwan. And finally, after a couple of weeks, she finally spoke this week, said something about Mr. Imran, who's been arrested on bank fraud. But since last January, uh, he was forbidden from getting into the House computer system, and he did House computers and data systems for the Congresswoman since 2005. So, Melba, what is your take on this? I mean, did she wait too long to say something? She said, I was afraid he was being racially profiled. Uh, he's a Muslim. I wanted to make sure. Here's a picture of Mr. Imran. Uh, and, and protect him and do what was ethical and right? I mean, where does this stand? You know, in my opinion, the, the reality is the law of this land is, you know, innocent until proven guilty. So as far as she's concerned, she was waiting to see if charges were going to be filed, where this investigation was going. And seeing the tenor of a lot of what's going on on the Hill, she had legitimate concerns as to whether or not he was being profiled. The minute charges were filed against him, she then released him from all employment, which, which makes sense to me. So I don't think this is necessarily such a huge issue. But the, the optics were, correct me, Mark, if I'm wrong, that he worked for a lot of people on the Hill a who, lot. who a lot. did cut ties with him first. In February. Which made Debbie Wasserman Schultz the holdout, if you will. And, and so the optics of it were that she was not going to cut ties with him for what reason? Well, but but also, she, he didn't have access to sensitive information, so it's not like, you know, he could have done damage from that perspective, is my understanding. Well, let's remember we don't know everything here. It's a criminal case. Let's also remember that the inverse of her statement that basically I was standing up against racial profiling is now implicating her fellow Democrats, claiming that because they released the mm -hmm. guy, they fell victim to racially profiling him, including some African Americans. So, yeah, who Frederica knows? Wilson. Yeah, Frederica Wilson, Congressman Meeks uh, yeah. from New York. I, there's, yeah. a, there's a number of them, Lois Frankel from West Palm Beach. Yeah. So we just don't know enough about the case. But on the optics issue, she was the head of the Democratic National Committee when it had an IT cybersecurity problem. Uh, when she was yeah. in Congress, she had an IT security yeah. problem. It's probably just coincidence, but if you talk to enough Democrats uh, whom she has estranged over the years, and there are many of them, 
they will tell you that the problem is, is that when she has bad luck, she then makes bad decisions uh, from a political or PR standpoint, and now she's just dealing with that. And the operative word is optics, right? It's another summer diversion, um, which I think is not going to end up anywhere, really. Well, Representative Ron DeSantis, Congressman, who may be running for Governor, Mark, he has said, oh, we need a congressional investigation into the way Ms. Wasserman Schultz handled this. Uh, I mean, does it really call for that, or is that just political gen ginning up interest in his possible run for governor. I'm from I'm for more investigations of every politician. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I may want to sort of button this up, uh, <clears throat> we have we in the mainstream media have been I've gotten so many emails and texts and so on. I know Glenna has as well. Maybe you have too, Mark. Uh, people saying you're covering this up you don't They're talk lunatics. about it these are just lunatics you're just dealing with the f like fringe far-right crazy people who now that the seth rich conspiracy turned out to be a not, not only a conspiracy and false but you know caused a grieving family to grieve more yeah but they're now trying to say oh this house it issue is as big as the russia investigation it's not but i think it's important and i think they're right in that regard and there are some media outlets that fell on their face not covering it right i can say politico was not one of them that is, we covered this yeah, from no, the No, you did cover it. Yeah. No, you did cover it. Well, I, I will say good? the reason we got emails, and, and this is important to note, is the Congresswoman was actually with us the Sunday that it broke. But unlike what we choose to do every week, she could not appear live, so we had taped it before. So when people saw the interview on Sunday, it was a taped interview. It might not have registered as taped, but there was this news out that was not part of that interview. And so in defense of the viewers who asked that very good question, that is the answer to that question and why we didn't ask about that. Your answer but to them is pay attention because we told you it was pre-taped. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the I calendar. Did, I, I, I love our engaged viewers. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, we cannot end our roundtable without mentioning President Trump and at least one Development uh, late this week that I found fascinating, it was the Washington Post, as you all know, printed transcripts of his conversations, phone conversations, with uh, the Prime Minister of Australia and the President of Mexico, and apparently he told President Peña Nieto that he got 84% of the Cuban vote, and <laughs> we wonder, where the heck did he find this figure? It doesn't seem at all accurate. We always wonder where he seems to get his figures. He seems to have a real trend of <laughs> embellishing things. Even today, he now he's in embellishing the economic numbers, which were improving before the year even started. And he, he, he gets caught up in his, his own words and his own reality. It's very odd to me. Um, but he believes that he's telling his own version of the news and everyone else is supposedly Fake news. Fake news. Yes. Yeah. You know, what I thought was, in all, in all the leaks, what was so interesting was how he had asked the president of Mexico, please don't tell them you're not going to pay for the wall. Uh, to me, it showed the political machinations, which I think every administration does, the optics and the politics of, but, but having the president of Mexico listening to the president of the United States ask him to keep the political optics going, that was kind of uncomfortable. And, and pathetic, truthfully, and I don't think he embellishes, I think he lies. And he lied to the potential voters during the campaign trail saying that I'm going to build this glorious wall and Mexico's going to pay for it, which anybody with real common sense knew that Mexico was not going to pay for that, and he's right? Learning, it was going to be the taxpayer dollar. And he's learning a very hard lesson that political rhetoric is very different from governing. So hopefully on his very month-long vacation while he's putting and engulfing, yeah. he can Think yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah, we, we should point out that according to knowledgeable people, President Trump got between 52 to 58 percent of the Cuban American vote and more power to him. I mean, that really was pretty good. Not as good, however, as Romney. Romney got like 65 percent of the Cuban American vote. Oh, no. Romney actually, at least in Florida, uh, might have been beaten, if not tied, uh, President Obama and yeah. President Obama's reelection. Uh, President Bush certainly did well. Yeah, one of the more interesting things back onto the wall in that conversation with the president of Mexico, Donald Trump says on there, this is not the most important thing.
politically, it's the most important thing. Yeah. So he's basically, in a candid moment, Donald Trump is saying, look, I don't yeah. really care about this wall, but you know, these yutzes who voted for me want me to build a thing. So like, go along with the fiction that, that I really think it's important. And I think that was telling. Do you mm -hmm. think if President Trump was candid, he would have so much more support from people who right now are not supporters if he were candid about things? Absolutely. He's losing support around the edges. And he's, that, this is the reason why he's visiting these cities that are supposedly about his base so he can get this adulated crowd around him cheering and, and huffing and puffing behind yeah, him. Yeah, but, but, but then he goes and he says things like, and I got a call from the head of the Boy Scouts saying it was the greatest speech uh, the Boy Scouts ever got, and there was no call. So Again, signs of pathological lies. I mean, I'm, I'm very concerned about this trend that we're seeing. That is going to be the final word. Melba, you got note. it this time. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Marlon, you. Mark, thanks for coming in. All right, next, a sit-down interview with former Vice President Al Gore, how he is tying this week's flooding in South Florida to sea level rise and global warming. A decade ago, former Vice President Al Gore won an Oscar for his documentary on climate change. You know what it's called, An Inconvenient Truth. Well, this weekend, the follow-up opened in theaters, An Inconvenient Sequel, it's called Truth to Power. This film is a powerful exploration of the progress that has been made to preserve the environment in the last decade. Also a measure of how we have failed. Late this week, I sat down to talk about it with Al Gore. Mr. Vice President, great to be able to speak with you. Thank you. Good timing. You arrive and your movie arrives in Miami the week we have record flooding, two to three feet of water. Miami Beach, just a few blocks from here on Brickell Avenue. Um, you didn't plan it that way. <laughs> no, uh, but the kind of event that took place on Tuesday here is the kind of event now becoming commonplace on a daily basis around the world. What you get is the global warming uh, goes most of it into the oceans, 90% of it. Uh, it. The rest is raising air temperatures and we're all feeling that. But what goes into the oceans puts way more water vapor off the oceans into the atmosphere and that's why we're getting these so-called rain bombs. We had a big one in my home city of Nashville not long ago. Thousands of my neighbors lost their homes and businesses and no insurance for it because it had never flooded in those areas before. So that's, that is, uh, what happened here Tuesday is directly connected to the climate crisis. Well, in Inconvenient Sequel, you are seen on Miami Beach with Mayor Philip Levine, City Manager Jimmy Morales, an engineer, and you're looking at the Ray Street, you're looking at the pumps, the remediation effort. They've spent half, $500 million over there, but this week it failed. Somebody might say, why are we doing remediation if it doesn't work? Well, I'm a big fan of Mayor Levine, uh, and I, I understand what happened this week was the electric power went out to the pumps. Uh, and boy, this is a challenge for all the low-lying coastal communities, and of course Miami's the number one uh, at-risk city in the entire world from sea level rise. That's different from the flooding from the rain bomb. That's due to the heat melting the ice in Greenland and Antarctica, and that water that results is coming into the streets. Got to go somewhere. Yeah, it's got to go somewhere, and it's come up high enough now so that the high tides uh, put put it into the streets. Yeah, uh, Mr. Vice President, um, President Trump, Florida Governor Rick Scott, Senator Marco Rubio, and a lot of other people say generally, um, any of the mitigating efforts to address climate change, global warming, sea level rise, cost jobs. It just takes, it hits the economy and we can't afford it. Now, what do you say to that? Well, all the ones you've mentioned get tons of money from the large carbon polluters and they've enforced this uh, orthodoxy of climate denial. And you know, we're the only country in the entire world where this is going on uh, the way it is here in the U.S. They took a page from the playbook of the tobacco companies who years ago tried to fool people into ignoring the doctor's uh, linkage between cigarettes and lung cancer, and they've hired the same PR agents, and uh, they control a lot of the politicians with the lobbying and campaign contributions. But on the question of jobs that you've asked, solar jobs are now growing 17 times faster than other jobs in the economy. If the Sunshine State, for goodness sake, was to really make a serious commitment to go solar,
people's electric bills would come down considerably, the air pollution would be reduced, and part of the side benefits would be we'd save the future of human civilization. <laughs> well, that would be a good thing. Um, <clears throat> a city here in our area, city of South Miami, just passed an ordinance requiring that all new homes built in the city of South Miami, a very nice suburb, have solar panels. The average yeah. cost is going to be $11,000. Home builders say you're making it hard for people to buy. So what's the trade-off here? Well, I'm a big fan of the mayor of South Miami and the council and what they're doing there. Uh, and the good news is these solar panels are coming down in price so rapidly. They now pay for themselves in three years or less in many cases. Uh, and in some states that have the proper laws and incentives, the companies put them on your roof for free and then your bills go down 20% and the company makes money as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And Al Gore says that he was deeply disappointed that President Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, but he also says he is not giving up on possible U.S. participation in that accord in the future. When we come back, the president announces his Raise Act on immigration just after his Mar-a-Lago club puts out the call for foreign workers. All right, time now for a quick look at the weather, and this is the view from our Fort Lauderdale cam. Here's weather authority meteorologist Jennifer Correa with a Sunday forecast. Hi, Jen. Hi, and it looks beautiful out there, Fort Lauderdale, but it is a little cloudier, Michael and Glenna, in Miami. However, it is still a beautiful Sunday for us. Now, the reason that we have more cloud cover is we have a little bit of moisture finally returning over us after days of some Saharan dust, and also the breeze picking up speed at 17 miles per hour in Fort Lauderdale. With that breeze going, expect a few isolated showers moving quickly across the area. For the most part, most of the shower activity is off offshore. So we're already hitting the low 90s across the area, topping that high of 91. A better chance for rain will arrive this week, especially by Thursday and Friday and into next weekend. Glenna. Jen, thanks. In an email this week, a viewer named Luce raised an interesting question about the President's RAISE Act. That's the bill that cuts back and redefines terms for legal immigration. Will favor applicants who can speak English, financially support themselves and their families, and demonstrate skills that will contribute to our economy. In Wednesday's announcement, the president explained the RAISE Act as a way to protect American jobs. Whether or not it would is now under debate. Worth noting, though, what the bill does not affect are H-2B visas. Those are temporary work visas for low-wage employees and jobs other than agriculture. Last month, President Trump's Mar-a-Lago Club in Palm Beach got the approval for 70 H-2B visas to essentially hire people from other countries to work there as housekeepers and cooks and servers during the season. That's October to May of next year. The documents like this, they're public record. They're right there on the Department of Labor website. It says no education skills required. It doesn't ask whether application, uh, applicants speak English. They'll make $10 to $13 an hour, and it's a 35-hour work week, according to those documents. You may know some people out of work right now, maybe young people or someone between jobs, who would love to earn a paycheck at Mar-a-Lago. It defies logic that the businesses of a president who wants to put Americans first aren't looking to hire from nearby zip codes or nationally on college campuses. It defies logic that applicants would be difficult to find, although that is what Trump's businesses tell the feds. There is general bipartisan support for fixing the country's broken immigration system. And in our community especially, there are people who work every day to help and protect the families involved. The RAISE Act probably won't be that fix because the provisions will make it difficult to get through Congress. Meanwhile, Mar-a-Lago has some job openings, if you know anybody. <laughs> Good luck to the huddled masses. So what do you think? We invite you to weigh in on, <clears throat> excuse me, any topic like <clears throat> email, or email, Facebook, thank you. 
Twitter, <coughs> any of these addresses, they're right here. We are very easy <coughs> to find. We are going to be taking some cough drops and cough medicine <laughs> behind the scenes. You have a beautiful Sunday. Thanks for being with us.